Films from the Wapaka Public Library. And our thanks, of course, to Laura Jandasek for being so good as to produce this series. Today, as you know, the topic is musical and romantic films of the classic era. And as a reminder, that era is 1927 to 1968, or from the end of the silent era till the end of the production code, which required stricter um, controls over what could be shown and said on the screen. So 1927 to 68, we'll be looking throughout the era, but we'll of course start chronologically. I think it's important to remember the specific age in which these musicals and romances were made. By that I mean in 1927, sound came to the screen and almost immediately followed the Great Depression in 1929. Audiences were very interested in escape, as you've heard said over the years, they wanted to be, uh, oh, it entertained. They wanted to be reassured. They wanted to think about something else besides the fact of the price of everything. So during the Depression and then World War II, the movies were very important. On September 1st, 1939, things changed again during the time when England entered the war. And at that time, Jesse Matthews and Vera Lynn got England through the Depression and the war, and the United States entered the war in 1941, of course, with the attack on Pearl Harbor. You know all this history, but I think it's important to remember that these films were made during this period, the post-war uncertainty, Korea, the Cold War, and it was the business of these movies to get us through these difficult passages in life. So we will take a moment to look today at these related genres. We have already done the mysteries last time and back in November, the Westerns available now on YouTube. But now we're taking a look at the musical and romantic films. We'll start with a historical overview. And as we go, I will pause and highlight a total of 11 films that I think particularly important and significant and recommended for you to view. A couple of cautions, there are hundreds and hundreds of musical and romantic films. I obviously cannot cover these all in the space of one hour. And in order to chop some of that time off, I will not be able to talk about the animated musicals. They are very good. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Cinderella, Gulliver's Travels, and many others come to mind. But just in the interest of time, I've had to arbitrarily put aside the animated films, perhaps another talk for another day. And then a reminder, what do I mean when I say genre films? Perhaps this is your first time with me, so let me define the term briefly. A genre film refers to a specific, definable type of movie with certain frequently repeated conventions. Westerns, mysteries, horror movies, science fiction, World War II movies. The best way to think of this is, if somebody were to ask you during the heyday of these pictures, are you going to the movies tonight? And you said, certainly are. They said, what are you going to see? Well, very few people, if they're talking about just a regular movie that is not a genre film, they're not going to say, oh, I'm going to see a movie about the human condition. It's about the stresses and strains of everyday life. And we have to be concerned about the people and think about what happens to them before. And they don't say that. What they do is they tend to categorize the movie by type or genre. I'm going to see a Western. Oh, we're going to see a mystery tonight. Oh, we've decided we're in the mood for a musical. So that way you can classify what these are. The Western repeats its conventions. You've heard about the black hats and the white hats and the good guys, the bad guys. The mysteries repeat their conventions. The detective solves the crime. The movie is over, QED. And the musical and romantic films have their conventions, many of which we'll discuss along the way. Well, let's get right to the chronology and get started with the preliminaries out of the way. In 1927 was a major year for the musical. First, it was the beginning of the sound era. You can't do very much with the musicals during the silent era, though some efforts were made. But it really comes into its own, of course, in the classic era. In 1927 on the stage, Showboat debuted, and it's considered by many critics the first musical stage play with an integrated sort of story, follows the story, the songs reinforce the story, as will happen later in Oklahoma and many others, instead of just, oh, a musical review. 
you know, sometimes they would have music in the movie, music, 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 but they wouldn't have really any kind of story. And so I'm talking about Starlift, Zigfield Follies, Words and Music, or perhaps some of you remember the classic era of radio when Fibber McGee and Molly would be doing their comic story and the King's Man would interrupt completely irrationally with a song about something else, just a musical interlude. So Showboat got the ball rolling with musicals that were straightforward story presentations. And the next, we'll show the first poster here, first slide is the movie, The Jazz Singer, which came out in 1927 and released by Warner Brothers. There you should see the slide on the screen. In 1996, many years later, the National Film Registry admitted The Jazz Singer to this Library of Congress honor. They bring in only 25 films a year. And this one was acknowledged for its historical, aesthetic, and cultural contribution. It's the story of a gifted singer, Al Jolson, whose father wants him to become a cantor. It was a huge hit for Warner Brothers and got the musicals off to a wonderful start. Then the second one I wanted to show a picture of, I'm not recommending the jazz singer, a little dated, but you need to know about it in terms of the history of the movies. 1929, the next slide, along came the Broadway Melody. The first in a series of Broadway Melody movies released by MGM, a major hit, the winner of the Academy Award for Best Picture of 1929. It was advertised to make it really clear that this was a big splashy musical, and you can see the stars there with the chorus ladies by advertising it as all talking, all singing, all dancing. There you have Anita Page, Charles King, Bessie Love. We don't really remember them very much anymore, but we do remember this movie because it was the first that was to have an original score composed for its own use. They weren't too sure that every theater in the land had yet been able to introduce talking technology. So just to be safe, MGM even released a silent version of this movie two years after sound came in to the rural theaters and the small theaters so that they could show it with a little three-piece orchestra, perhaps, for musical accompaniment. The main thing about Broadway Melody to remember right now, it's wonderful songs, of course, are memorable. Broadway Melody, You Were Meant For Me, Wedding of the Painted Doll, many of these to show up and sing it in the rain many years later. But the thing to remember about the Broadway Melody is it's a subtype of the musical genre. I want to talk to you today about three or four subgenres within the genre. This one is subgenre number one, the backstage musical. Now, backstage musical, as you can imagine, is always about let's put on a show. It can be Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, let's put on a show in your father's barn in the many movies they made together. Or it can be more seriously, a big production that is about to go on stage. There's always a love interest, of course, often a triangle, often several love interests in triangles. But by the uh, easy expedient of putting on a show, they could showcase the music and showcase the actors and actresses, have a fairly thin plot, perhaps. They could see rehearsals. They could see backstage. They could show us the Cinderella story of a young person, usually a female understudy, becoming a star as a result of the show and so forth and so on. Easily adapted from stage musicals or as in the case of Broadway Melody here, uh, they had their original score, as I said. And there would be many other Broadway melodies. That's MGM. Warner Brothers, another major studio of the day, was right in there with its own brand of musicals. And here comes the next one, a portrait of Ruby Keeler, star of 42nd Street. There she is. Ruby Keeler was immensely popular from 1930 to 1941. This is recommended movie, my list of recommendations, number one for today, 42nd Street, released by Warner Brothers in 1933. She made seven films with Dick Powell and of course movies with other folks as Dick also did, but they made seven together. And this was the one that really brought them together to public attention. There was even a revival of this durable musical on the stage in 1980, directed by Gower Champion. And of course, one reason it survived, 42nd Street, is the words and music 
by Al Dubin and Harry Warren. 42nd Street itself, the wonderful song, You're Getting to Be a Habit with Me. And my personal favorite, of course, from this, Harry Warren was very interested as a composer in railroad music. Did you ever think of that for a sub, sub, sub genre? Very interested in trains. And he wrote the music for Chattanooga Choo Choo on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. And this song, Shuffle Off to Buffalo, which is in 42nd Street. He wrote them with different lyricists. This time it's Al Dubin. You can practically sing. I guess you'll be happy to know I'm not going to try to sing, but you can practically sing the words if you just think about what they say, because they're so melodic and the rhythm and the music are so natural. So when Ruby Keeler and Charles Townsend sing about their train trip on their honeymoon, does this ring a familiar chord with you? Um, to Niagara on a sleeper, there's no honeymoon that's cheaper, so away we'll go. That's the way we shuffle, shuffle off to Buffalo. And for just another quarter, we can have the Pullman Porter put the lights down low. That's the way we shuffle, shuffle off to Buffalo. And then Ginger Rogers and Una Merkel singing from the top berth of the Pullman on this stage set. If she knew what we know, she'd be on her way to Reno in a week or so. But that's the way you shuffle, shuffle off to Buffalo. 42nd Street also has wonderful dance numbers staged by Busby Berkeley, the master of choreography of these backstage musicals and many, many others. He had developed, uh, his technicians had developed a single moving camera which they used overhead from the sides. It was much more than camera up and film a stage play. In fact, in his book on Hollywood genres, Thomas Schatz, the great authority on this, says that the fluid camera was, quote, the single most significant formal development in Hollywood 30s musicals. So with all of this going on, uh, 42nd Street, first recommended movie. Our next one also came out in 33, also Warner Brothers. This is Gold Diggers of 1933. And you see the young ladies of the chorus there and they have this E Pluribus Unum in front of them and they're doing a dance to the song, We're in the Money, the Women in Coins. At one point, Ginger Rogers even sings it in Pig Latin. The words again are by Al Dubin and Harry Warren. This movie was in production fast in order to take up on the popularity of 42nd Street. Songs like Pettin' in the Park, My Forgotten Man. Much of the same cast, Dick and Ruby, Ginger Rogers, Guy Kibbe, Ned Sparks, with the addition of Warren William to add a little dignity to the proceedings. Warren William, the man who played Philo Vance and the Lone Wolf. Similarly, a backstage musical, Busby Berkeley again. And as you might tell from this shot, a little bit of pre-code naughtiness, absolutely. The code came in, the production code, in 1934. These movies came in in 1933. You can think of many other backstage musicals later. We'll just leave this slide up for a moment. A Chorus Line, 1985, of course, all about backstage. Chicago, 2002, somewhat about backstage. And The Boyfriend, back, way back in 1971, when Sandy Wilson's musical play was turned into a backstage musical comedy by Ken Russell. But all of them have similar plots, the romantic couple putting on the show, or as we leave this particular section for a moment, you have, might have the words of Warner Baxter ringing in your ears when he says to Ruby Keeler, who has to go on stage and carry the show, it's opening night and tryouts in Philadelphia. They're on the way to the show. This is 42nd Street again, and the leading lady sprains her ankle and Ruby Keeler has to be out there to be the star of the show. And Baxter's famous line, much repeated in other movies, Sawyer, you're going out there a nobody, but you're coming back a star. And that's the tale of the backstage musical. Now we move on to a romantic sort of star persona musical, we'll call it. Musicals that featured these stars, and these stars were so big that they could carry lots of different material. This particular slide we're going to now is from Top Hat, released by RKO in 1935. It wasn't all Warner Brothers and MGM. RKO Radio had its own fans. Of course, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. 
Ginger from Independence, Missouri, Fred from Omaha, Nebraska, but they made international music. This movie, Top Hat, is my second recommended movie for your list if you're keeping a list. You can also watch many others, but this one is good. It has dancing cheek to cheek, top hat, white tie and tails, isn't this a lovely day, and the major production number, the Piccolino. Of course, Astaire and Rogers' star persona was so important. As more than one author has said, they worked so well with each other. Not only did they dance beautifully, but as critics say, she gave him the necessary sex appeal, if you will, and he gave her the class. And between them, boy, they certainly moved. And they moved audiences for a long time. From 33 to 39, they made eight films together and one more in 49, The Barclays of Broadway. The beginning ones all for RKO Radio, Flying Down to Rio, The Gay Divorcee, Swing Time, Follow the Fleet, Shall We Dance, Story of Vernon and Irene Castle. You can pick any of them if you want. It's a matter of personal preference. Top Hat to me is about the quintessential movie in which everything works. And other stars that I'll be talking about today, Cary Grant, Katherine Hepburn, uh, Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy come to mind right away, as well as Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney and other famous couples. But in a star persona, maybe Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy will do as well. I don't have a slide of them, but they just had Bittersweet on Turner Classic Movies last night and others of theirs still play. Maytime, Rosemary, Girl of the Golden West. So the kind of interest in the splashy musical and the romantic couple gets us into our second sort of genre. But now I wanna talk about a specialized category. What were the other studios doing? While MGM and Warner Brothers and RKO with Fred and Ginger were out for the musical audience, the others didn't give up. Here from 1942 is a splashy poster coming up from Springtime in the Rockies. And there you have it. Betty Grable, John Payne, Carmen Miranda, Harry James and his band, and down at the bottom, the comedy relief from Charlotte Greenwood and Edward Everett Horton. My goodness, what a splashy poster. Look how that Cesar Romero and Betty Grable dancing over that bowed springtime in the Rockies. And it was, of course, the Canadian Rockies, by the way, if you hadn't seen it. And typical of Fox, they like to go international. They had movies out like Down Argentine Way. They liked to feature Carmen Miranda. Busby Berkeley did a number of specialized films for them as well. And then while we leave that poster up, I'll mention in passing, you also have the biographical musicals. It was very easy to put together a biographical musical. You followed the course of the life of the star, and then you talked about his, her, or their musical collaborations and so you went forward with uh, the music because you already had the music. Those are famous songs they had written. You picked the best one. Sometimes you fictionalized a little bit, but you certainly went forward. Republic released I Dream of Jeannie in the early 50s, story of Stephen Foster. Yankee Doodle Dandy, much earlier, Warner Brothers, 42, of course, James Cagney and his Oscar-winning turn as George M. Cohan. Three little words about Bert Kalmar and Harry Ruby, the songwriting team with Red Skelton and Fred Astaire released in 1950 by MGM. And in the era past the classics, that has continued, hasn't it? Loretta Lynn, depicted by Sissy Spacek in the uh, great little movie, Coal Miner's Daughter, and then Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man and recent history about Queen and Elton John. And so that, that genre continues. And another little genre, sub-genre, the B musical. We don't think about it, but you know, in those days, the B pictures were still being produced by studios like Monogram and Republic and Columbia, and they had their share of musicals. Bill Haley and his Comets, certainly. People would say late in the classic period, the Elvis pictures in some ways were B movies with A productions. They had titles like Bop Girl Goes Calypso, 1957, released by United Artists. And the one I want to show you right now, we have two slides of B pictures. This one is Desi Arnaz and Holiday in Havana, released by Columbia in 1949. Yes, I've seen it, and no disrespect to Desi, not particularly recommended. Leonard Malton, the critic, calls it 
bargain basement musical entertainment, but it's significant for fans of Desi and Lucy because it is about a year before Desi hits it big with Lucy on television and I Love Lucy, and the girl there is not Lucy, but Mary Hatcher. The movies were not very careful about how they handle internationalism, and Mary Hatcher is obviously not Cuban, but she is playing his Cuban girlfriend in this B picture directed by Gene Yarborough. Two years later, Gene, who directed a number of B pictures in all genres, had another one out. We have another poster here for this before we leave this arena, Casa Manana, released by Monogram in 1951. A big splashy poster for what is really a black and white 73 minute movie. But let's look at it for just a moment because it did try for a certain amount of internationalism. The stars are over there on the far right, middle upper right, Virginia Wells, Robert Clark, Robert Carnes, you probably don't remember any of them. The two top ones are pictured right up there above. But then look at the bands they choose. Not only Spade Cooley, all right, and his Western band, Hadira and Manias, okay? The Rio brothers, Armando and Lita. This was an attempt, you see, to go all over the world to Latin America and to have songs like Silito Lindo and The Bounce and so forth as they're listed here, Madame will drop her shawl that are either sung in Spanish or have Spanish components. Oh, Casa Manana, another example of a B picture. I'm afraid it's not particularly recommended, however. And I want to mention while we leave that up a moment that Turner Classic Movies this month of March is featuring the films of Doris Day. They're not all musicals, of course, but the early ones certainly are. And now we're coming to a Doris Day poster, which we'll show next, Warner Brothers in 1951, Lullaby of Broadway. Here we have Doris with Gene Nelson. This is my third recommended movie. It's really a recommendation for any Doris Day musical of this era. Romance on the High Seas, certainly a good one, her first one with Jack Carson and Janice Page. And then moving along to T for Two, Lullaby of Broadway on Moonlight Bay. That trio of Doris Day pictures came about because Jack Warner, the Warner Brothers executive, discovered that they had lying around all kinds of rights to old music and the rights were not doing them much good because the music was not being purchased these days and they were not managing to get the maximum out of it. So they had the idea that they would put together material they already had, songs like Lullaby of Broadway, You're Getting to Be a Habit with Me, and they would make stories out of them. This is true of T for Two on Moonlight Bay and this backstage musical, Lullaby of Broadway with Gene Nelson there all the same characteristics. We're putting on a show. We have a romance. She is not particularly well known. In fact, she's the daughter of a singer. She's, but she is fairly well known when it starts, but she has to carry the show. And so there's that kind of uh, tension about whether it will work or not. Of course it does. The song Lullaby of Broadway originated in Gold Diggers of 1935 by Dubin and Warren. And of course, getting to be a habit with me and 42nd Street. They added songs like Just One of Those Things by Cole Porter. Now you might prefer Calamity Jane from 1953 if you wanna see Doris at her most energetic, rambunctious best. But I recommend Lullaby of Broadway or one of the other two, T for Two on Moonlight Bay to really see what Doris is capable of in this early period. And as you know, she only recently passed in 2019. One little personal word here, Glenda and I were in Scotland in 2019 at the time of Doris Day's death. And it was interesting to us that the London Times, which I looked at every day, had very little going on about news in the United States, but three pages on the death of Doris Day. She was such an international star, so well known and so well liked that picking up one of her movies is a good idea in your recommended musicals. Next, of course, we come to the granddaddy of them all, my fourth recommendation, a musical in which everything works, and that is Singing in the Rain. We're showing next the iconic image of Gene Kelly on the lamppost. Now you remember Singing in the Rain, I'm sure the ultimate backstage musical, although it is really also a backstage uh, at the movies kind of musical, not Broadway stage. 
this uh, song appeared, Singing in the Rain, first with Cliff Edwards, who later became the voice of Jiminy Cricket, Cliff Edwards and his ukulele in a movie called The Hollywood Review of 1929. But here we have the definitive version with Gene Kelly there singing lyrics like, let the stormy clouds chase everyone from the place. Come on with the rain, there's a smile on my face. And there is, and there is on ours too with Debbie Reynolds, Donald O'Connor, and the great Jean Hagen. She played Lena Lamont. Remember this movie is about, and surely you've seen it, but it rewards viewing time and again. That's why I'm recommending it. Surely you have uh, seen this kind of plot before. They were coming into the sound era, and Lena Lamont was the lady who was a star in the silent era, but she couldn't play the roles in the movies with sound because her voice was so terrible. So in the movie, we'll slow down a minute here, her dialogue coach says to her, no, no, Miss Lamont. It's played by Kathleen Freeman. You want the rounded tones, the rounded vowels. I can't stand him. I can't stand him. Now, Miss Lamont, you do it. I can't stand him. No, no, Miss Lamont. I can't stand him. I can't stand him. What do you think I am, dumb or something? Well, this movie particularly is notable for a theme I always talk about, illusion and reality in the Hollywood pictures. They want us for sure to know that this is real on the screen. But of course, we know it isn't. But we suspend, as Samuel Taylor Coleridge said so many years ago, we suspend disbelief. He was talking about poetry and stage. We're talking about the films especially. We suspend our disbelief and we enjoy it for what it is, an illusion and reality merged together. But this one is a great example of illusion and reality and one little way in which it is, one little way in which it is, is of course artificial rain coming down on Gene Kelly and the artificiality of some of the singing. Debbie Reynolds' singing voice was, uh, she's very young, she was from El Paso, and it was thought to be, her singing voice was thought to be, well, they didn't know about it. So she sang some of her songs, but in more difficult ones like the song, Would You, I Would, Would You, she had to be dubbed by a lady named Betty Noyes. So Betty Noyes did the voiceover and Debbie Reynolds mouthed the words. Okay, but this is a movie about dubbing somebody else's voice. And Debbie Reynolds is supposed to be dubbing Gene Hagen's voice when singing for her. And also they thought there was too much twang, the studio executives thought, in Debbie Reynolds's voice for some of the spoken system. So who did they get to dub Debbie Reynolds for the spoken word? And for dubbing Debbie Reynolds, dubbing Gene Hagen, they used Gene Hagen, the actress who had a naturally cultivated voice, but was doing Lena Lamont strictly to get an Academy Award nomination for wonderfully stepping outside her normal voice. So Debbie Reynolds dubbing for Gene Hagen, who is dubbing for Debbie Reynolds, and Betty Noyes dubbing for Debbie Reynolds part of the time as well. Movies, illusion and reality, but enjoyable nonetheless. Now we're gonna move from the backstage musical to another subgenre, the folk musical, and we're putting up on the screen a poster of one of the major folk musicals, Oklahoma, with Shirley Jones and Gordon McRae, released by 20th Century Fox in 1955. What is a folk musical? It's a kind of musical that has lots of singing and dancing by large groups, choruses, dancers, ordinary folk, supporting characters. The focus might well be on the romance, as it is here between the two stars, but the musical turns into a big, splashy production, featuring a line from The Wizard of Oz, you might say, that happiness is in your own backyard. The folk musical celebrates traditional values, uses a lot of music and dance derivative of real folk music and dance. The Harvey Girls, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, Oklahoma State Fair, The Music Man, and many, many others talk about the kind of material that you have Think about Oklahoma for a moment. Certainly you have the tender songs, but you also have the big numbers. Territory folk should stick together. Territory folk should all be pals. Oklahoma itself, a huge number. I just got back from Kansas City, another number with Gene Nelson. 
big numbers, splashy dances, lots of just plain folk. One of the key lines from the farmer and the cowman should be friends typifies the musical Oklahoma when the actress Charlotte Greenwood as Aunt Eller sings, I'd like to teach you all a little lesson and learn the words by heart the way you should. I don't say I'm no better than anybody else, but I'll be danged if I ain't just as good. The folk musical. And in 1962, we'll get the next show uh, slide up here, please. Uh, we're showing a scene from 1962, Warner Brothers, The Music Man by Meredith Wilson. This is my fifth recommended musical. Uh, I can really vouch for most of all these, except the B pictures. But this one I think is worth a particular stop. Shirley Jones and Robert Preston, look at the folk, a 76 trombones number, the people gathered on the street to see their kids marching in the band in the rousing conclusion with 76 trombones. You also have wonderful little lyrics between the lovers, good night, my someone, till there was you, but you rouse along with, we got trouble in River City, which is a Robert Preston number, but a huge chorus of people backing him up. The Iowa welcome song, you can join the celebration, or bring the food you bring, eat your fill of all the food you bring yourself, that's it. The Wells Fargo wagon is a coming down the street. Big numbers like that in the Music Man and big splash. Now we're gonna hold that, uh, have that slide we have up, excuse me. We're moving to another one that came out the year before. There's a very different kind of musical, but sort of a folk musical. This is West Side Story, 1961. And there you have George Shakiris in the center there with a salmon colored sort of jacket, orange there. And he is getting his gang ready to go against Russ Tamblin's The Jets and the Sharks and West Side Story. This, of course, is based on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet and is different from musicals we've been talking about so far for the most part because now we are concerned with diversity, we're concerned with social issues, we're in a gritty, grimy situation, our locales are very different. You can see the back tenements there, we're not let the fence, we're not looking at any kind of thing normal to most musicals. Of course, the wonderful Bernstein music but of course the sad ending. Richard Bamer and Natalie Wood who played the stars had to have their voices dubbed. George Shakiris did not. And George Shakiris, who was a natively wonderful dancer, very talented. He won the Academy Award for best actor, supporting actor, excuse me, in this movie, West Side Story. It is indeed a sad story. And that brings us to another point. Many of those we've seen so far have had happy endings. But now as we move to the more toward the modern era a little more, we're getting away from happy endings. One other area we need to talk about before we leave the musicals is the international era. In the 60s, toward the end of the classic period, which you remember ends in 1968, movies were either, musicals were often set abroad or even filmed abroad. Mary Poppins, for example, though filmed in the Disney studios, was in fact set in England, of course, and was very popular, 1964. That same year, a much less known movie came out that I'm gonna to recommend to you. It was actually uh, judged by the Academy to be awarded, eligible for awards in 65, because it first showed in this country in 65, but it is made and released in 64. This is a slide from that movie, next up please, of the Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Catherine Deneuve, on on the left, excuse me, and Nino Casalnovo on the right. They are singing their undying love in a cafe in Cherbourg. This is my sixth and final recommended musical. I will have some romances to talk about in a moment. This has been called the most cited French musical in Oscar history. It had several nominations. The music is by Michel Legrand, the direction by Jacques Demy. They filmed in Cherbourg and on some studio sets, but mostly in Cherbourg and real sets. And you'll notice at the back that chartreuse shade, uh, they didn't, or glass, they didn't really like, Jacques Demy did not like the plain colors of many of the settings. Though they set about painting the town pastel pink and blue and green and chartreuse so that they could have the kind of setting he wanted for the movie. 
and they were allowed to do that. And it's a wonderful, wonderful sort of romance. A couple of things about it. If you've never heard of it, give it a try. As I say, this is a recommended musical. It is entirely in French with English subtitles. There's a Criterion Collection edition of it. Uh, if you saw the musical La La Land in 2016, Damien Chazelle, who wrote that, has publicly acknowledged his indebtedness to the Umbrellas of Cherbourg for his story about the romance taking place in Los Angeles. Remember, he highlighted the colors and reimagined Los Angeles. And in one of the first scenes of La La Land, our hero and heroine are in front of an umbrella shop so that he can pay homage even in the picture to the umbrellas of Cherbourg. It is all sung, every single word. There's no spoken dialogue in this movie. It is an opera, a light opera about the undying love. But unfortunately, spoiler alert, the love does not live forever. And like West Side Story, we come to a somewhat unhappy ending. Even if there's a swear word in this movie once or twice, it's sung, everything is sung. And all this in the same year as Mary Poppins, The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Let's go then to one more slide for the musical. And after this, we'll go to the romances. Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music. Here she is singing to the kids uh, the Do Re Mi song. And that's one of those beautiful enduring images. And another example, of a film film internationally. Winning the Academy Award for Best Picture, musicals did tend to win over the years, quite a few awards. An American in Paris in 1951, a musical as Best Picture. Broadway Melody of 1929, I already mentioned there are others, but in the 60s, that happened a fair amount. 1961, we've already mentioned West Side Story, 1965 here, and in 1968, going to have Oliver, again, filmed internationally at the very end of the era uh, by Carol Reed in Great Britain. And now, if you will, just hold Julie Andrews there for just a moment. We're going to move back to the Great Depression, start again chronologically, and go somewhat more briefly through romantic films. We still have romantic films with us, don't we? You need only look on the Hallmark Channel. Let's briefly define the romantic film a film that is exclusively or almost exclusively devoted to the romance between the two leads. Almost exclusively devoted to the romance between the two leads. Other characters, even other suitors may come and go, they may appear, but the focus is on the romantic leads. Everything else is secondary, very secondary. The romantics and the romantic comedies only want to talk to us about the leads. Now, you might say, well, Dr. Rhodes, all other genres also include, don't they? Uh, how do you define those romantic elements? And I'd say, yes, they do. Obviously, in High Noon, a Western genre, you have Gary Cooper and Cotty Arado, and you have Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly. Romances in the Thin Man mystery genre have Myrna Loy and William Powell, but they are clearly a happily married couple solving mysteries. There's a romantic element, but it's not the point of the picture. The point of the picture is the mystery. 42nd Street, a musical. Yes, Dick Powell and Ruby Keeler, but the main thing is the backstage story and the music. And it's not a romantic movie. It is a musical with romantic elements. And even Forbidden Planet, the love between Leslie Nielsen and Anne Francis that blooms on Altair 4. This is a science fiction movie. It is not solely about the romance it's included but the resonance of the romance is entirely the point of a film like our next slide and first romance picture, It Happened One Night. This is my first recommendation of a romantic film. If you haven't seen it, by all means do, released by Columbia in 1934. They're hitchhiking. She's not desperate enough to eat the carrot. Gable obviously is. The Warner Brothers people said, though this was a Columbia picture, that their inspiration as animators for Bugs Bunny was in fact Clark Gable and it happened one night. The big ears and the carrot and Bugs Bunny was born. Plus the fact that a secondary character, Roscoe Carnes, always refers to him not by his name, but Doc, as in what's up Doc. This won the Academy Award in 1934 in the big four category, not to be repeated until one flew over the cuckoo's nest many years later. What do I mean by that? 
best picture, best director, best actor, best actress, a perfect quadrangle of Oscars plus other Oscars. It happened one night, 1934, following, of course, the romantic plot, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. Now we're going to turn to a sub-sub a genre within that, and this is a genre of romantic comedy, a few films known as the comedy of remarriage. The film we're looking at now on the screen still will be from The Awful Truth with Irene Dunn and Cary Grant in a nightclub. The comedy of remarriage is defined by Janine Basinger in her recent book, I Do and I Don't, a story of the Hollywood comedies, comedies of remarriage especially, have to do with a couple getting divorced or about to get divorced and deciding that lo and behold, they belong together and they should not get divorced after all. They try other people, but it doesn't really, excuse me, doesn't really work out. So they come back to each other. This is directed by Leo McCary, The Awful Truth. He won the Oscar for it, released by Columbia in 1937. Now, one of the things you'll notice in three examples of the comedy of remarriage, the ladies always come back to Cary Grant. The husband that they are about to leave come back to Cary Grant. The second movie we're looking at also stars Irene Dunn and Cary Grant getting away from each other. That's my favorite wife. And there you have not, as it happens, Irene Dunn, but the actress Gail Patrick, whom Cary Grant is supposed to be marrying. The plot of this one, based on Tennyson's poem, Enoch Arden, of all things, is that she has been away, marooned on a desert island, and long thought dead. She, excuse me, being Irene Dunn, Cary Grant's wife. So he thinks he's free to remarry. She's been off on the desert island with Randolph Scott. So by the time they get back and are rescued by a tramp steamer, here's Cary Grant about to be married to Gail Patrick, realizing that Irene Dunn is for him, and Randolph Scott, of course, fading out of the picture as Irene Dunn comes back to Cary Grant. Cities of remarriage, the same thing. People loved it. They loved the married couple, the thin man, and those mystery comedies as well. Now we come to the ultimate comedy of remarriage, 1940, in this next slide, The Philadelphia Story. Here again, we have Cary Grant in the center. The suitor is James Stewart. The woman coming back to him is, of course, Katherine Hepburn. This is my second recommended romance. If you haven't seen the Philadelphia story, I think you're in for a treat. It's a little dated, but it's still pretty good. And Stewart won the Oscar for his performance for Best Actor. And again, she comes back to Cary Grant. Here we are in the finale scene at the wedding. No, it's not backstage per se, you might say, but it is backstage in a sense as its story behind what leads up to the wedding day, directed with great flair by George Cukor for MGM in 1940, second recommended movie. Another very excellent one uh, to talk about a little bit briefly here next is The More the Merrier, released by Columbia in 1943. This slide is a little fuzzy, but it's Gene Arthur, Joel McRae in the center, and Charles Coburn. In Washington, D.C. during the wartime, it was very hard to get accommodations. And so Jean Arthur had an apartment. She sublet it to Joel McRae. He sublet his part of the sublet to Charles Coburn on the right, who won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. And before it's all over, they will be in love and Coburn will have subletted his part of the sublet up to about a dozen or so characters from the streets. So <laughs> there we are. Well, not all of these end happily, of course, and we're going to go to Britain for an example next. My third recommended movie, Brief Encounter. Here we have Celia Johnson and Trevor Howard in the tea room of the railroad station at Milford Junction in this Eagle Lion release of 1945, directed by the great David Lean, also responsible for Dr. Zhivago, Great Expectations, The Bridge on the River Kwai, and here the director turned his attention to a simple romantic story between two people who meet in a train station. But the problem is she is already married. And so it cannot end in 1945, especially it cannot end and will not end with the two of these lovers staying together. And it has a sad ending. And in the romances, as opposed to the Westerns and the mysteries and the other genres, 
and the musicals, we are almost always most emotional and most happy or most sad at the ending. Depending on how it comes out, we leave the theater one way or the other, strongly moved in the romances. This one has to violate the boy gets girl. One of the things that's really interesting about this one, her beautiful eyes, Celia Johnson was wonderful in this part, later to be outstanding in the prime of Miss Jean Brody in a supporting part. But here she is making the most of this part. And this is an example of the woman as the viewpoint character. So many of these, of course, it's boy meets girl. Boy meets, boy always comes first. In this one, she is our viewpoint character. And we travel with her back home and back to the railroad station. But she is the one we're really following and interested in. The two of them, but her in particularly. The next one, also an international setting and film, Roman Holiday, famous, of course, and my number four recommended romance, Roman Holiday, released by Paramount in 53, there on the Vespa motorcycle, Audrey Hepburn in her Oscar-winning performance or breakthrough film, and Gregory Peck pointing out the sights. In Brief Encounter, the train station confines most of the action. A little bit of it is out other places, but it's right there, adapted from a Noel Coward play. But in Roman Holiday, the whole city frees up the action, complements the action, and talks about, although this love is also not destined to be, all of the fun they're having certainly gives you the hope that that romance will come about. Now I'll tell you another story before we put up the next slide. Let's hold Roman Holiday as a slide there for just a moment. And I want to talk about another very popular movie starting in 1939 and being remade in 1957. Let's go to 1939. And in this, let me just tell you the story first and then we'll look at the posters. 1939, the movie. Man and woman fall in love aboard a ship bound from Europe back to the United States, but they are betrothed to other people. They get back to the United States after having stopped to meet his grandmother at a beautiful villa at a port stop along the way. Back in the United States, they decide that if their love is true, they will meet in six months at a designated time atop the Empire State Building. And if they're both there, they'll go on with their life together. And if not, they'll go their separate ways. So let's get to the poster, Laura, on this next one. Love Affair, Irene Dunn and Charles Boyer, a Leo McCary production, 1939. There's Irene Dunn again. And of course, the great French romantic idol, Charles Boyer, in this story by Leo McCary, written by Delmer Daves, who was more known for his Westerns like 310 to Yuma and Drumbeat than he was for writing romantic comedies. But at any rate, here we have Love Affair, very popular, 1939. And then the next poster, it comes to life again, same story, same director, Leo McCary, Cary Grant, once again, a staple of these movies with Deborah Carr in An Affair to Remember. 20 years after The Awful Truth, there's Cary Grant again. Is this love to be or is it not? As she says at one point to her fiance, Richard Denning, these things just happen. Nobody meant for this to happen. And you know the story, perhaps. This is my recommended movie number five, either version, An Affair to Remember in color with a song by Vic Damone. I know people who like this movie who start to cry when the credits come on and Vic Damone sings the song, Our Love Affair is a Wondrous Thing, which we'll rejoice in remembering. And this, of course, the basis for the romantic comedy Sleepless in Seattle. We'll leave that slide up there just a moment to talk briefly about the films of Doris Day with Rock Hudson and Tony Randall, Pillow Talk in 59, Lover Come Back in 61, Send Me Low Flowers, No Flowers in 64. But in addition to that, she made that touch of mink with, guess who, Cary Grant, and she had another entire career with these romantic stories and comedies after her musical career and also dramatic as in Julie and Love Me or Leave Me and Midnight Lace. Now I want to go to just two more slides. We'll wrap this up. There is a movement late in the 50s, in the 50s, I'll say mid 50s actually, to uh, when studios discovered they had property rights and would remake the movie as a musical. So we'll use these to finish up by showing how the romance 
could become a musical in its own way. Here are June Allison and Jack Lemmon in You Can't Run Away From It, directed by Dick Powell, who had moved on from his role as the youthful singer back in the 42nd Street days and was married for a while to June Allison. And here they are in the walls of Jericho scene in this musical black and white slide, but a color movie, You Can't Run Away From It, released by Columbia in 56. The Awful Truth had shown up in 1953 as a musical called Let's Do It Again with Ray Meland and Jane Wyman. And our last poster for today, High Society, Bing Crosby, Grace Kelly, Frank Sinatra, Celeste Holm, Arima, and Louis Armstrong, a musical remake of The Philadelphia Story. So Philadelphia Story, 1940, with Grant and Hepburn and Stewart, and here we have Crosby, Sinatra, and Kelly in 1956. All of these done because we wanted to merge together the musical and the romance, shows how close these genres are. We'll leave this poster up for a moment while I talk about some other modern movies, classic and modern, you may want to check into for romances. Summertime with Katherine Hepburn and Rosanna Brazzi, 1955. Three Coins in the Fountain, of course, with the three couples, 1954. One in Venice, the other in Rome. More recent romantic comedies that I know Glenda and I enjoy, and I'll just recommend that you might like. A New Leaf in 1971, Walter Matthau and Elaine May. The Great Moonstruck with Cher's Academy Award performance in 87. Sleepless in Seattle, 1993. And if you haven't seen them, you might check in to the two-person movies, which really are basically only two people following the relationships of Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke in Before Sunrise, 1995, and Before Sunset in 1994. So we finished our slides and we're back to the opening credits. I'm about to take questions. So I just wanna quit by saying, we've come to the end of this overview of these two related genres, separated in part by their styles, musical or otherwise. To me, perhaps the clearest example of merging both into one is the Umbrellas of Cherbourg, where we were only interested in the two main characters for the most part, and every single word is also sung. These films carried our ancestors through war and depression. They are still entertaining us today. And I hope you have enjoyed this review of the musical and romantic genres and will join us again on Thursday, April 1st for the final installment in this spring series from the Wapaka Library, Creature Features, Nightmares, Horrors, and Science Fiction of the Classic Era. Thank you for attending this afternoon. Thank you, Jack, that was wonderful. Um, so now we're gonna open it up and if anyone has any questions or any comments that they would like to share with Jack and the rest, um, please type them into the chat box. Um, you can type it, uh, send it to staff or to myself, Laura, and we will relay those. So we are awaiting questions. Where would you type? Oh, there's a chat. Yeah. I guess you click on that and then type. I see Dick and Sandy on the screen. <laughs> oh, yeah. We've enjoyed it, Jack. This was fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. And it looks like Lynn Murtha said, thank you, delightful presentation. Thank you. Well, no real questions so far? We don't have to have questions, but if there are any. <laughs> Oh, okay, so um, someone typed one out to Jan. What does Jack think about The Graduate? And this is from Robert Herzog. What, as The Graduate, as a, yes, that's a very interesting question. Right at the end of the classic era in 1967, The Graduate I would call as, um, oh, it's a movie that has so many dimensions. We are certainly interested in the romance between the two. And of course, more than two. Uh, not only the romance between Dustin Hoffman and Mrs. Robinson, but also her daughter. So we're following that very carefully. It is not a musical in the sense of people breaking out in song, as you know, and that's 
really a requirement of this genre. I should have stated it more plainly. But it is a movie that had a tremendous impact on musical history of the movies because uh, this movie had that wonderful score by Simon and Garfunkel. Up until this time and through the height of the studio era, we had had a situation where uh, they had orchestras, MGM Orchestra, RKO, and they produced this music for the soundtrack. They had all kinds of musicians that were on hire. They had Anton Karras and the Third Man, you know, the zither and so forth. But then when they figured out that they could do a soundtrack of wonderful songs, some original, some new, and some old, and so forth, they could do whatever they wanted and mix it, they didn't need the big studio orchestras anymore. Uh, the music carries the graduate. I agree with that. It is not a musical, but it's certainly a movie in which the musical is undeniably there. And it's another case where the music is almost singable because as you talk it, you sing it. Robert Preston's character says in The Music Man, remember, singing is just sustained talking. And that's because if you have the words, you can sort of see where the music is going once you know the words. So here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Jesus loves you more than you will know. Ho, 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 right? You can, you're singing it as you say it. And that's a great question because that is saturated in music. Not a moment goes by from Benjamin in the pool to any other arriving at the airport. It's all music and we're drenched in it. And yet it isn't, I would say, thought of mostly as a musical, but a picture with profound, serious consequences, immensely popular and still very popular. Some of the lists I've seen said that in adjusted ticket sales, it may be the third or fourth best-selling movie of all time. Okay, good question, Bob. Robert indicated that that was one of his favorite romances. Well, it is a favorite, wonderful romance. So I'm trying to answer it as both a romance and a musical because it does have both elements. Good and one. Are there any but, other? Just barely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any other questions or comments that you've got for Jack this afternoon? I must have covered it all, Laura. I think you did great. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.